Welcome to Insight. Today we are chatting with Tara Chaklovsky, founder and CEO of Iridescent, an organization that she founded in 2006 to deliver powerful science, engineering, and technology education to empower underrepresented youth. Tara has generously agreed to share some of her experience with us. I'd like to thank you, Tara, for joining us today. My pleasure. So one of the great gaps in our society is that young people who uh, grow up in challenging economic circumstances are very often deprived of the very tools that would allow them to change their lives in this economy, which is a knowledge-based economy. Talk about how you came to the conclusion that you wanted to dedicate yourself to the founding, the building, and the uh, of such an organization, the delivery of such education opportunities. The path wasn't a straight one. Um, I grew up in India, and in my uh, I had an unusual upbringing. My parents brought me up as a boy, uh, almost. They said, "You can do anything you want," and um, so I grew up fixing engines. I grew up. Uh, climbing trees, doing all the sorts of things that uh, girls in India are not supposed to do. And I think it was a very powerful um, experience for me because there was nothing that I thought that this is not what a girl does. And um, so I grew up wanting to be a fighter pilot. And um, uh, when the Indian Air Force started to accept women into the Air Force, I was super excited, but it turns out I was too short. And so I spent a lot of my summers hanging upside down from a tree. Uh, trying to increase my leg length, and that didn't work. And so I was like, what's the next best thing I could do? And I said, OK, maybe I could make airplanes. And so um, I came across a copy of an uh, old Popular Mechanics. My parents didn't have too much money, but I looked at it, and I was totally struck by this, this guy called Paul McCready, who had created the first human-powered airplane, the first solar-powered airplane. And I was like, I want to work here. Um, and so I slowly sort of made my way to Southern California. Um, I was doing a PhD in aerospace, and I got to work at that um, at Air Environment. And uh, it was very powerful. I got to meet Paul McCready. He was old by that time. And I got to work on one of the first unmanned aerial vehicles. Um, and it was interesting to me to move from one country to the other and to come firsthand in contact with um, low-income communities and sort of a different culture where people don't think that science and engineering is something within your zone of comfort. So what's interesting there is that you grow up in, in, in a culture within a family that is giving you this experience of navigating your own culture through the sensibility of your parents who basically say, the sky's the limit, define yourself, Forget about what everybody says you can and cannot do. Define what you can do, and you do it. You come to the United States, and you get exposed to people who have that attitude, but you also get exposed to the limitations that are embedded in this society that are based on social strata. Yep. And, um, and so it was very intriguing to me to be um, the only woman in an uh, aerospace company, but also uh, one of the few women in sort of the aerospace engineering departments. Um, and I, I just, these were just interesting sort of questions in the, in the periphery. And um, for so many years, I had sort of worked hard to come to this point. And it was, it was interesting to me that there was a larger question sort of pulling at me now that was more interesting. But then, of course, you're like, OK, for 20 years, I've worked to, to do this. I'm going to finish this. Uh, and the similarity between what you had experienced viscerally in India and what you were experiencing in the United States is, is very striking. In that particular case, you decided to f focus on doing the impossible, which was being a fighter pilot. <laughs> and, and then you come here, you find barriers, and then you're also thinking about how do you overcome those barriers. Right, and I think um, um, at some point I decided maybe taking data in a wind tunnel is not going to change the world. And um, I, it was a hard decision for me because um, I've been brought up, you don't quit, right? You, you keep going and doing things. And so I was like, but there's something bigger here that I can do. And so I was close to finishing my PhD, and I decided I'm not going to do it. And it took me a couple of months to really sort of look deep and say, what am I good at? What, do I, what drives me? And the fundamental question was, or oh, the, the big thing is that I, I really love motivating people to do very hard things. 
And I think the larger question that I, I set out to answer was, how do you motivate children um, who don't have the resources that their, their society, their family provides them? And how do you set them up for success so that they can change the world, right? So that they can be on the table that is sort of talking about innovations and solving all these very complex problems. And so I went about it um, really understanding what are the key solutions that are working, what are, and I wanted to make something that's very scalable, low cost, um, and has a deep impact. So these were sort of the three constraints. So it isn't just about motivation, it's also about setting the table. No matter how motivated you are, if your environment is not one that is encouraging, and your environment as a child was encouraging, or even if, if the environment isn't encour encouraging, uh, is encouraging, but you don't have the wherewithal, the, the capability, um, you're basically starting to deconstruct this problem and, and taking its components to include motivation and other people's attitudes and the programs that, that are hospitable to that journey. That's exactly right. And I think figuring out the formula, right? So I came in sort of with an engineer's hubris that it couldn't be that hard. And, um, and then I start to see what are some of the things that are working across different sectors, for-profit, non-profit. And I didn't go in thinking, OK, I'm going to start a nonprofit. I wanted to really come at, like, how do you solve this problem in a large scale way? And I, I chose the nonprofit route because I was like, you, you, can, you can have an earned income stream, right? Mm -hmm. um, but you are also open to grants and donations. So it's almost sort of, I, I totally don't see that there's a huge difference between nonprofit and for profit. It's just that your, the customer typically doesn't give you the money. The money comes from a third party, right? Yeah. But the same systems still need to be in place. Talk about the size of the organization, the types of programs you, you uh, bring to children and families, and, and how many children you serve. Yeah, so um, we're going into our 10th year, and um, the team is about 27 people now. We have a $4 million budget. And um, I think for, for us, we've gone through many phases where um, initially, I was just trying to figure out what is an intervention method that has impact and um, doing it ourselves. And then the idea was that once we know how it works, then we would try to um, swap out pieces of it with technology so that we could begin to scale. Um, and then the second stage would be when we train others to, to, to use these tools. We reach about six, between 6,000 to 10,000 children every year. Um, and over the 10 years, we have trained about 3,500 engineers and scientists. And they have gone out. and. Um, mentored and engaged 63,000 underserved children and parents um, across 87 different countries. And the whole idea thematically is to help uh, children, um, particularly children of lower incomes, to pursue these fields in technology, engineering, and, and so on and so forth, uh, to give them the, the fundamental approaches and thinking style uh, that they can, they can pursue their interests. That's right. I think it's not success is not that they became scientists and engineers, but it's really that they develop this strong sense of self-efficacy that uh, they can solve any any problem, right? Uh, and it just happens that engineering and technology are great tools. Um, but it's this mindset of innovation and leaders, leadership, right? Like you look at a phone and you're not scared to say, okay, I'll open it up and I'll see what's inside. Most people are afraid to do that, you know? So it takes some sort of courage to, to do that. Um, and uh, so, so the model that we came across, uh, we, we developed was that we would train engineers. They go through anywhere between like 10 to 40 hours of training where they learn how to communicate technical concepts. Um, and then they go into low income communities, but children and family and parents together. And then they spend 10 hours week after week just building and exploring and learning things that align with the engineer's expertise. We have two programs. One is called Curiosity Machine, which is primarily for um, families and younger children. And it's physics and engineering. And Technovation is um, technology entrepreneurship for uh, middle and high school girls. And so girls identify a problem in their community, and they develop a mobile app and launch a, techno a technology startup. Um, and so we operate in 87 different countries. and. Uh, our mode is now where we provide the training, the content, and sort of the analytics uh, about how each of these stakeholders is interacting to different partner organizations. So we work with UNESCO, UN Women, uh, Peace Corps, and then that's internationally, but locally um, organizations like Boys and Girls Clubs and Girl Scouts and different school districts. So uh, we are shifting into this r realm where uh, we are more of a backbone organization 
um, providing these core tools uh, to or, uh, other education organizations. Sarah Chaklowski, thank you so much for sharing the work of Iridescent. We'll be so interested to see how the organization continues to evolve. And thank you so much for your insights. Thank you, Mark.